And uh, with that, Philippians chapter 1 today, and again, our text will be verses 7 through 11. I'll ask you to stand if you're able. If not, that's all right. Where you're seated, you can follow along as I read. The Apostle Paul is writing by the Holy Spirit and says, verse 7, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God, verse 8, can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, verse 9, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray if you would join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to you for your word and this portion that we have before us today here in your word. That's why we're here. We want to hear you speak into our lives concerning those issues that we face in our lives. So Lord, Will you at this time, as only you can and always do, speak? Your servants are listening. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So, I want to talk to you today about something that has been an enigma of sorts to me over the years concerning prayer and my prayer life. More specifically, when and why it is that sometimes prayers seemingly go unanswered. And in order to do that, I need to approach the text by making some observations as it relates to what and perhaps more importantly why the Apostle Paul prays what he prays for the Philippians. I'm sure you've heard the saying, prayer changes things, and certainly that's true, but prayer is so much more than that. Prayer not only changes things, prayer changes us. And prayer not only changes us, prayer changes how we see and even how we treat other people. That's what I want to talk about today. It's abundantly clear here with Paul in our text such that he cared so deeply about the Philippians because he prayed continually for the Philippians. It just comes leaping out of the the text. I mean, did you notice the emotion with which Paul writes to them? I mean, he says, God is my witness. (laughs) I mean, God, God himself can testify how my heart longs for you. God knows my heart. God sees the heart. Man only sees the outward appearance. And God knows my heart for you. You almost get the impression that he's pining for them. He aches for them. He certainly loves them. And that's because of his prayer for them. Now, why do I point this out? Because this is exactly what happens 
when we pray. It changes how we feel towards those for whom we pray. Stay with me on this. And notice with me, verse 7, where Paul expresses these strong emotions, these strong feelings. And he says that he longs for them in his heart in spite of the fact that he's in chains. I mean, he, th- he, he thinks about them all the time. His heart is there with them. His heart longs for them. Now, I have to be honest and say that if I'm chained, imprisoned in Rome, as Paul was, I'm probably not thinking about you. I'm sorry. I'm not really longing. I'm I'm just, again, I'm being honest and transparent. Come on, we're in church. We have to be honest, right? I'm not longing for you in my heart. I'm longing to be released from prison. (laughs) But not Paul. I was uh, thinking this morning, in fact, I looked at it uh, before I came today, where in, I want to say it's 1 Thessalonians, uh, I might be wrong, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's chapter 1, where Paul basically says that he cares for, and it's actually in the context of when he was imprisoned in Philippi, to which this uh, letter is written to the church in Philippi. And he says basically this, he says, I care for you like a mother who is caring for a nursing infant. Oh my goodness. I mean, guys, when your wives nurse your children, is there not, I mean, there's nothing that compares with the beauty of that moment. And Paul is saying that that is how he feels about the church? That... uh, That convicts me because when I ask myself the question, especially as a pastor, of how could Paul love this church so much? He he loved them so much. I mean, that much? He he says in verse 8 that... Again, God can testify how he longs for all of them with the affection of Jesus Christ. In other words, his affection for them, his fondness for them, his love for them is likened to the love and the affection that Jesus has for us. Oh. Please don't ask me if I love you as a church as much as Paul loved them as a church. I mean, I love you. I mean, I say that, and I hope you know that I mean that, but I have to confess that. I, not as much as a mother nursing an infant. I'm sorry. That's love. try to answer this question. How could he love them that much? Answer, because he prayed for them that much. Paul certainly prayed for them because he loved them, but what strikes me is that his love for them came vis-a-vis his prayers for them. The more he prayed for them, the more his love abounded toward them. And this is why, to me, in verse 9, Paul prays that their love will abound more and more in both knowledge and depth of insight. And then in verse 10, he also prays that they'll be able to discern 
what's best so they'll be pure and blameless until Christ returns, which is interesting. Reminds me of what John said, the one who has this hope in him purifies himself. Then, in the last part of his prayer, in verse 11, he prays that they'll be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Here's where I'm going with this. One of the main reasons that many of us in our interpersonal relationships are riddled with conflict is because of this. If you were to ask me what I thought was one of the main reasons that our relationships are riddled with conflict, it's this. You see it there on the screen. And I'll use the marriage relationship as an example. Instead of praying for each other, the husband and wife will stay angry with each other. Have you ever noticed that you cannot stay angry at somebody for whom you are praying? Oh, you might start off, you know, and, and actually you start, you know, uh, praying like David prayed. God, kill him! No, no. I, I promise you, God is not going to answer that prayer, okay? <laughs> but no, you cannot stay angry with someone for whom you are praying. And there's a reason for that. You want to know why? Because this is how God wired us, if you will. This is what happens when we pray. It changes us from the inside out. We're no longer mad at them. Why? Because God gives us a love for them when we pray for them. Because see, now we have an investment in them. And our heart changes towards them. The reason I use the marriage relationship as an example is because here you have this marriage conflict between husband and wife. Did it ever dawn on you, husband, and I'll pick on the husbands because, again, I'm just as guilty as the next guy. But you're having a, 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 a conflict, or as one pastor said it, for pastors, we don't call it that. We call it intense fellowship. Um, <laughs> When we're having intense fellowship slash conflict slash argument slash knock down drag out. <laughs> it reminds me, I, I got to share this. It's just, it's too good. It's too funny. And it's been a while since I shared it. So, um, so the story goes that this husband was bragging about how he'll never let the sun go down on his anger. That I mean, even if he and his wife have to stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning and not go to sleep when they're angry, he says, we will not go to bed angry. And sure enough, my wife will come crawling on her hands and knees to me. And she'll say to me, come out from underneath that bed and fight like a man, you coward. I kind of like that one. <laughs> but here's what happens. And this is actually something my wife and I uh, did many, many years ago. We made the decision to never discuss weighty issues in the evening when we're tired because there was such a greater propensity for a conflict that we would always wait until the morning. We had a good night's sleep. We were fresh. God's mercies are new every morning. And we would seek him first, and we would pray. And I'll tell you, it changes the whole complexion. In fact, what usually happens is you wake up the next morning, and, and you're like, okay, what, what was that argument about again last night? <laughs> oh, the toothpaste cap. Yeah, that was it. I'm sure. That was, boy, that was a deal breaker, wasn't it? But this is how God has made us. 
our heart will change toward those for whom we choose to pray. And I use the word choose for a reason. The reason is, is that the onus is on us to make the decision to go against how we feel about them and choose to pray for them. And when we do, boom, it changes everything. Because you might start off with, Lord, just bull, bull, bless them. Ah. And it might be like that at first, but boy, it's not long before it goes from Lord bless them to Lord bless them. Bless them. You pronounce God's blessing on them. And you know what happens? God blesses you. And God changes you. I think it's something that Oswald Chambers once said, maybe this is a word for somebody here today. I know that uh, God used it in my life in a powerful way, especially in my marriage. And of course, you know that as a pastor, you know, my wife and I have been married 30 years next month. We have a perfect marriage. So this is all theoretical for me. (laughs) Is there a lightning bolt coming down (laughs) from But Oswald Chambers said, it's not, have you been wronged? It's, have you wronged? And early on in my marriage, I was like, here's, here's basically how my prayer, prayers went. It's like, oh God, show her that she's wrong. <laughs> really? Like, like God's in heaven going, I knew it. I knew she was wrong. Okay, I'm on it, JD. I'll get right on that. No. <laughs> it's more like, oh, 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 you want me to show her that she's wrong? A couple months ago, I, <clears throat> I opened up the cabinet. I don't know where this came from. I need to talk to Pastor Mac about this, but <laughs> there's a log. And it says, remove from I before speaking. <laughs> Matthew 7. <laughs> is this yours? It is? It's for us. Oh, oh it's for me for me. Okay. We'll talk about this later, brother. (laughs) So here I am. Lord, get that speck out of her eye. And God's going, oh, really? I can't. Sorry. (laughs) I have to get the log out of yours first. Ouch. Ouch. I got the scars to prove it too, by the way. Listen to what Matthew 5, uh, Jesus said, verses 43 through 45. I need to move a little faster here. I like a lot faster. <laughs> Let me preface it this way. This is the how behind the what of praying for someone with whom you are angry. This is the key. The secret, if you will. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and, here it is, (laughs) wait for it, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For real? Yeah. I'm to pray for my enemies? Yeah. I'm to love my enemies? Yeah. I'm sorry. That's not an easy do. I hate them. Let's be honest. Again, we're in church. (laughs) I don't want to love them. and I'm certainly not going to pray for them. Oh, but here's the thing. If you pray for them, you'll love them. That's how it works. That's how God wired us. 
Yeah, my wife would, uh, again, this is many years ago when I had an imperfect marriage, my wife would <laughs> say to me, you know, I love you, but I don't like you right now. You know, she has to love me, right? And I'm supposed to always love her, but I don't like you right now. In fact, I hate you right now. I love you, but I hate you. Okay. Well, if I feel that way, then I make the choice to pray and the hate will go away. Because again, you cannot remain angry or upset with someone for whom you are praying. That's how God made us. We have a problem and I want to address it in the remainder of our time together today, and it's the matter of unanswered prayer. I am keenly aware that there are those who would say, you know, when I pray, nothing happens. I mean, maybe for you, you know, when you pray, God moves his mighty hand on your behalf and changes everything and changes you, but... I pray and seems like my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. What I want to share with you, it's not exhaustive, it's not in any particular order, but over the years I've kind of put together a list of what I see as the seven biggest reasons as to why prayers remain unanswered, and I'll go through these quickly. The first one's very specific to husbands. So wives, uh, don't elbow your husbands, and husbands, uh, we need to talk. <laughs> Unanswered prayer can be due to a husband who mistreats their wives. There's this verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, that to this day searches my heart, and rightfully so. Listen to what the apostle Peter wrote. Husbands. In the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner. That's in the physiological sense, not inferior spiritually or in any other way, physiologically. And as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that, listen, nothing will hinder your prayers. Did you catch that? Let's flip that around, which is what I always like to do when it comes to Scripture to have a better understanding. If Peter is saying that the way I treat my wife has the potential to hinder my prayers, then wouldn't that also mean that if I treat my wife respectfully, dwell with her in understanding, as another translation renders it, very interesting word in the original, and am considerate and loving that my prayers will be heard, you betcha. You betcha. Talk about having scars to prove something. I've got many scars to prove this. Many times I'm petitioning the throne and the Holy Spirit in that still, small, gentle voice says, stop right there. Do not go any further. It's not that I don't want to answer your prayer. I cannot answer your prayer because of the way you're treating your wife. You get that right first and you come back. And we'll talk. But until then, I cannot. I cannot. You need to make that right. So I remember a, a pastor sharing once that um, he would always leave the house early on Sunday morning before his wife woke up so that he wouldn't get into a fight before he preached. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, the enemy's right there. Timing is everything, right? And there's nothing that the enemy would love more than for me to get behind this pulpit as is my privilege to do <laughs> and talk with you like I am today about marriage. And here I just left the house where my wife's going, man, I, I sure wish that I was married to the same guy that's behind that pulpit every Sunday. Ooh. 
One time, she, this is on the mainland, she, many years ago, again, when I had an imperfect marriage, she, she said to one of my elders, she said, you know, I, I want to take this pulpit home. Can you guys load it up in the back here? <laughs> and she said it with an earshot. She knew I was right there. I'm like, I'm going, you know, guys, we don't get it, right? I'm like, why do you want to take the pulpit home? <laughs> because I want the man that's behind it here at the church, in my home. No wonder my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling, man. Okay, I'm getting way too convicted. Let's move on to the second one. <laughs> the second reason, and I, you'll forgive my, uh, this is, I mean, this, uh, and, uh, you would think is a firm grasp of the obvious, but unanswered prayer can be due to unasked prayer. And this, of course, is what James wrote in Chapter 4, second part of verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask God. Have you ever heard someone say, or maybe you've even said it yourself, God already knows what I need, why do I have to pray? (laughs) Because it's not like when you pray you're talking God into something. No, you need to pray because prayer changes you. Prayer changes you. And by the way, dare I say that one of the greatest sins, and I'm going to be strong in saying this, one of the greatest sins in the church today is to complicate prayer. I shared one time about how, and nothing wrong with this, but E.M. Bounds, I mean, he has written voluminously on prayer got my hands on a thick volume on prayer. This huge book, I'm like, man, I'm going to read this book on prayer. So I start to read it, and the Holy Spirit's like going, dude. (laughs) That's not how the Holy Spirit talks to me, but. (laughs) Um, In the time that it takes you to read this book, do you realize how much you could have prayed? That book sits on my shelf to this day, (laughs) and I just instead just prayed. Prayer is simply talking to God. That's all prayer is. Please don't let the enemy get away with complicating just talking with your heavenly Father. That's all prayer is. Ask Ask. This sort of ties into the third reason for unanswered prayer, which is that when we do ask, our motives are wrong or our motives are selfish. James goes on to write, chapter 4, verse 3, when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You know, as you mature... In Christ and growing grace, you really come to appreciate the prayers that God did not answer because they would have been horrible if he did. You know, I keep a prayer list I have for many, many years. And I go back, I mean, we're talking about 20 years. And I look at some of the prayers I prayed. It's very interesting to see what God did, you know, way back then. But uh, I, I look at some of those prayers that I prayed and I just cringe I am mortified. I'm like, oh, God. I almost, you know, find myself going, God, delete this one. (laughs) Scratch that. Don't answer that because, oh, my goodness, if you would have answered that prayer the way I prayed it, thankfully he does not. Here's the fourth reason, and it's a biggie. It's because what I'm asking for is not the will of God. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. The Apostle John writes, this is the confidence, I like that word, you can be confident, bold in prayer. We have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Cool. Oh, Lord, won't you go? A Mercedes. 
Mercedes Benz. There's a reason why that, that Mercedes Benz is not in your driveway. <laughs> it's not God's will. They, no, that's not to say that, you know, you can't have nice things as long as those nice things don't have you, but that's not God's will for your life. That's why you have a Hyundai in your uh, driveway instead. <laughs> But it's not God's will. And then number five, it's not God's timing. This is a hard one because in a way you could say that God will always answer your prayers. You just may not like the answer. Because <laughs> either the answer is going to be yes, no, or wait. I got to tell you, I'm, I can usually handle a no but boy, when God says, wait, I hate to wait. And so do you, so don't look at me all spiritual. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Interesting. Listen to this. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. Have you ever thought of it that way? That God delaying is not God denying. It's rather God being merciful and gracious to you in delaying. Sometimes our prayer is too small, too low. God say, really? You want me to give you that now? I want to give you this if you'll wait, way more better. It's been said that if the timing is wrong, God says slow. If I'm wrong, God says grow. If the request is wrong, God says no. But if I'm right, and the timing is right, and the request is right, God says, here you go. Sometimes it's just a matter of timing. And that ties in with the sixth reason for unanswered prayer. And this is an interesting one because it's a lack of persistence on my part, and I just give up too quickly. In Luke's Gospel, the 18th chapter, Jesus teaches a parable about this tenacious and persistent widow who would just not give up in seeking and pleading for justice against her adversary. And finally, this unjust judge, not to be compared with God, a just and righteous judge, but he finally just says, man, just to get her to quit bothering me, I'm just going to give it to her just because she's, she's not going to give up. And the point of the parable is in the first verse of chapter 18, where we're told that Jesus spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. By the way, let me parenthetically say that this is so true when it comes to that prodigal son, that prodigal daughter, never, 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 never give up. You persist. You keep praying. Do not grow weary in well-doing and well-praying, for in due season you will reap if you faint not. I, I made this statement uh, a while back, but a prodigal son or daughter is no match for a praying parent. Never give up. Never give up. God loves your son, your daughter more than you ever could. And you're praying according to his will, right? Don't give up. You will have that which you ask for. Persist. And don't lose heart. This last one, I, uh, I'm sorry I'm ending on this one. I don't want to get up in anyone's grill. But certainly, unanswered prayer can be the result of regarding sin in my heart. In Psalm 66, I want to 
read both verses 18 and 19 for a reason. I think you'll see why here and we'll close. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Now, this is not talking about sinlessness. This is talking about unconfessed sin, living a life above reproach, a heart of integrity, a heart of purity. If you cherish sin, you regard iniquity, you hide sin in your heart. Again, it's not that God won't, it's that God cannot. It's inconsistent with who he is and how good he is. And this is why verse 19 is so important. David writes, but certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Because again, this is one of those where you need to flip it around. In other words, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear my prayer. That also means that if I don't cherish sin or regard or hide iniquity in my heart, God will hear. You come to him with a right heart, a pure heart. That's why purity is so powerful. And that's why it is, by the way, and maybe this is a word for somebody here today, that Satan is always tempting us towards impurity because he knows that if he can get us walking in it, impurity and not walking in integrity, he has stripped us of the very power that is ours by prayer, that confidence. He strips us. He steals it from us. And Jesus said the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's how he destroys us. Well, again, I'm sorry to end on that note, but let's pray. Father in heaven, I... I thank you that the Holy Spirit can take everything that we've looked at and seen here today in your word and everything we've heard and now begin that process of applying it to our lives and certainly our prayer lives. Lord, will you do that for us? We're asking you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.